Welcome, everybody, to this webinar on data-driven services for farmer-led business. This is the fourth webinar that we have. It's, a, it's a, the fourth in a series of webinars facilitated by the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation, GIFAR, and co-convened with the Technical Center for Agricultural and Rural Cooperation, CTA, and our two presenters today are from CTA, and with the Global Open Data for Agricultural and Nutrition Initiative. This series is a follow-up on a four-day course that we had in Centurion in South Africa in November last year, where we discussed different aspects of farmers' access to data. This fourth webinar in particular will discuss data-driven services for farmers and the role that farmer representing organizations can have in helping farmers exploit the potential of such services. We have two presenters today. As I said, they both, uh, they're both from CTA. Uh, the first one is Chris Addison. Chris is currently Senior Program Coordinator for the Data for Ag project at CTA, a project which focuses on data use to benefit smallholder farmers. And without listing all the projects in which Chris has been involved, some of which you can see in the short bio that we have on the webinar page, um, suffice it to say that Chris has worked in the ICT and knowledge management for the development sector for the last 18 years. And then we have Chipo Zemzegi, uh, project coordinator at CTA and responsible for the coordination of capacity development activities within the Godan Action Project. Uh, this project aims uh, to strengthen data users, data producers, and data intermediaries to engage with open data and maximize its potential for impact in agriculture. So to start with, I'll give the floor to Chris. Thank you, Chris. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Valeria. And um, I'd like to begin by explaining um, we unfortunately couldn't attend in Centurion because at the same time we had an event uh, here in The Hague um, looking at uh, data management, specifically weather data management. Um, and as a result of not being there, I thought it'd be useful just to say a tiny bit about CTA um, to explain our work and uh, where we've drawn some of these lessons in relation to data management for farmers' organizations. So we're a joint international institution of the Africa, Caribbean and Pacific states and the European Union. And what that means is our staff are drawn from European countries and from African countries. There's around 70 of us in total here uh, based in Wageningen with a small office in Brussels. But we actually work in uh, 79 African, Caribbean and Pacific countries and we've been uh, around for 35 years now, focusing on information and knowledge management uh, to support agriculture in the ACP. Um, so as it says, our mission is to advance food security, resilience, and inclusive economic growth in Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific through innovations in sustainable agriculture. And ICT is very much a core part of that and the application of um, technologies. And our vision is really focused on smallholder agriculture being a vibrant, modern and sustainable business that creates value for farmers, entrepreneurs, youth and women, and produces affordable, nutritious and healthy food for all. So we've run a series of activities and been involved in a series of commissioning a series of studies to look at this issue of farmers' access to data, uh, the most recent of which would have been our support to, to uh, financial support to the GFAR course um, that uh, several of you will have attended. And we also had this Data for Agriculture Week, of which we'll talk about uh, later. Lessons are also drawn from our CTA Data for Ag project, where we work together with the Pan-African Farmers Organization, PAFO, and Agricord, in supporting a number of uh, farmers organizations in data-related activities. So those range from farmer registration to um, extension services built on the top of those farmer profiles and linking with some of the data, uh, for example, from open data sources. So I'll but focus on some of those elements and Chipa will be talking more about the Godan work we've been doing on open data and the links there. So we've also supported Godan, the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition, uh, looking at the potential use of open data for smallholder farmers. So there's some interesting studies that you may be interested in, including a field study looking at the data used by farmers organizations and profiling the 
types of data sets that are needed to provide different services. And this culminated in a couple of policy briefs where we actually had um, summarized the key actionable points uh, for how you would deal with this data and uh, the kind of concerns you had to take into account if you're moving into this area. Um, and finally, as I say, Chipo will be speaking about the GoDan Action work. So starting from the key elements, I mean, we're all aware of the explosion of mobile phones and the fact that that really led to this huge amount of data being available and services based on data being available to potentially the smallholder farmer. So this was a quote from Ishmael Sunga, really making it clear that investing in a mobile phone was as important as investing in other agricultural tools. And that if a smallholder farmer is going to invest uh, in that, in, in a, a phone, be it a basic uh, phone receiving messages by SMS or being it uh, slightly more sophisticated, the farmers' organizations needed to make sure they were supporting the farmer to access the kind of services and the kind of data that uh, they needed. So in this case, Ishmael is with the Southern Africa Confederation of Agricultural Unions. And we had a request from the Pan-African Farmers' Organization because the East African Farmers' Federation was doing something similar. They were looking at building platforms, data platforms that could support the farmer being a mixture of membership profiles, but then in East African uh, Farmers' Federation case, actually looking at yields, prospective yields and crop profiles from farmers so that they could access new markets by aggregating those farmers together and being able to tell the customer when crops would be available, an idea of the kind of yields they could provide. And that's been part of the data for ag work that we're now supporting working with the East African Farmers Federation on extending that service to now provide uh, extension inputs based again on the kind of information they have about their farming membership. So what can you do once you've got the data available? And as we said in the title of this piece was really talking about the data driven services available to farmers organizations. And they fill into kind of four areas. So we have those services which can help with production uh, based on diagnostics and advice, kind of the extension, early warning alerts. And we had trade and market information, obviously market prices, um, certification, traceability, the use of data within the value chain to improve efficiency of value chains and also data on the types of inputs and services available uh, for farmers. And the other two elements being the access to finance, uh, insurance and credit services that we're able, that we're now able to, um, the farmers organizations are able to provide to their members by having more data on exactly what they're growing, where their farmers are located and uh, what crops uh, they're growing. But all that information really comes from the farmer registration. And that's the identity, the membership, the profile of what that farmer is growing, the size of the plot they're growing on. And the geolocation is the key together with the uh, contact point, the phone number through which that farmer can be reached. Now our study looked at how the different services led to different data requirements throughout the growing cycle. So when um, we're looking at the starting point of ownership and rights to use the land, uh, there's that element in some, in some cases. In the case of farmers' organizations, we've been looking more at location of land plots and size uh, that are being farmed. Um, in order to provide a legal framework and subsidy seems, for example, one of the groups we were looking at working with provides inputs, uh, which the farmer then effectively pays for when they produce their crop to the processing plant, the uh, factory uh, where the crop is uh, processed. The, the calculation of the subsidy the, or the amount of inputs provided really relies on that proper profiling of the land. So important to collect that data at the beginning. The geolocation obviously affecting what climate zone, what available of in, availability of inputs are there. And particularly in relation to the financial support, 
the detailed information on exactly what size of plot is, is uh, under cultivation, exactly which crops are there. And as I mentioned, if you have that additional information of likely yields, that obviously all that information contributes to the guarantee uh, that the bank is going to take to provide financial services. And in the case of insurance, uh, it, insurance payouts for uh, climate events, say extreme drought and so on, can be based on that geolocation information. And for each of the individual phases, we have similar services and data set requirements. A lot of this fundamentally fits and is based on a good profile of the farmer, so being able to collect that data in the beginning. The key point here being to preserve the ownership of the data or certainly to be clear to the farmer how that data is going to be used and held by the farmer's organization. So the starting point of the farmer profiling uh, processes that we've been supporting for uh, Lesotho, Swaziland and uh, Igara and New Cafe in Uganda and the other projects that we're looking at supporting in the near future um, relies on a similar approach where the first step is to really identify what your management agreements are, what the privacy agreements are with the farmers, taking account of national legislation. So in the case of Uganda, there's several uh, elements of the data legislation there that we wrote into the effective agreement between the farmers organization and the farmer before they provide profile information. There needs to be a lot of thought into the profile form. Uh, clearly, it's quite expensive collecting information. Um, we've actually been looking in the, in the cases that we've been working with on face-to-face -face collection um, with kind of uh, average costs of uh, three to five uh, euros, um, let's say yeah, approximately three to five dollars per farmer. Uh, in terms of enumerators interviewing those groups and then recording that information in the field. Um, determining the calculation of how many enumerators you need, what training is needed and what monitoring in order to manage the whole process is clearly uh, a key part of the planning. Very early on though, the next key element is communicating with the farmer to make it clear what you're collecting this data from, what their rights are, what agreements you have in collecting this data, how you're going to use it, how you're going to inform them if you look at other uses in the future. And in the projects uh, we've been supporting, this has been done in a variety of ways um, through the uh, association's normal activities, so the normal farmer meetings that are convened, the normal community meetings that are convened in face-to-face, -face, um, but also through public campaigns uh, such as radio, for example. And the interesting thing here was in taking this new, uh, in this case, we're really working on collecting the data digital from point to point, so it's going to be recorded on tablets and then transferred to the core databases run by the farmers associations. Um, we needed to explain what was going on and how that data would be used and how that data could also be given back to the farmer in the form of potentially a, a printed profile um, and giving them uh, a data that they could use themselves. Um, and we've had a, a number of different examples of that that we found in the projects running so far. The second step is really to uh, set up the enumeration team. Um, I think some of the key lessons here were that uh, we needed to be training more people than the, the we were going to be um, using because we needed to have some selection process as to their performance in the field. Now enumerators uh, could be drawn from um, the local community, they could be within the association already playing roles, uh, they could be from the farming community. We've had different models uh, in, in the different projects we've been associated in with and from feedback from some of the PAFO members who've been working in this area. And we're trying to kind of pool this experience and we hope to be able to work with yourselves and GFAR in bringing this together um, to, uh, to build up um, a real kind of formulation of how this can be best done. We're currently using um, some software to capture the profiles through interviews on uh, using tablets. Um, so a simple form that's filled in in the field directly with the farmer. 
and that links with some training then that we've supported in the farmers organization so we feel this is a, a key element that the farmers association does need that capacity for some data management in terms of visualizing the input and we've been using a, a web-based platform for this um, we've although there may not be direct connectivity in the field in some cases the tablets can upload the data when they have better um, connectivity and that can then be viewed and monitored to measure progress of the registration process um, the latest series we've done in Uganda was around um, uh, 7,000 registrations um, but we have used this system for much higher numbers in other projects the web system is okay, but really because of connectivity issues, the association wants to use a local system, and that's where we've been using the software QGIS. This means that uh, by using a geographical information system, they can map the membership, and this really is the first starting point for being able to better manage a lot of the activities of the associations, be they representing associations or be they uh, commodity groups, um, uh, for example, maybe even uh, also the cooperatives and uh, the farmer-led associations in tea and coffee, for example, we've been working with have worked this way. The final point is uh, that there's also some training of the management in terms of this really can change the way they're doing business. And for the farmers association, it can even change the revenue streams. Rather than just relying on membership contributions, there are now opportunities to provide services based on the data. But running through all this is that very first step of gaining the confidence of the trust of the farmer that the association is acting in their best interests with the data they're collecting and the services that can be offered. So how does this look from the farmers organization perspective? Um, it gives them a much better handle on planning and strategy, um, being able to forecast more accurately the financial revenues, uh, as has been the case with East African Farmers Federation supporting the granary service. And it allows them to um, provide much more uh, much more targeted services because you have that geolocation information and the information on exactly which crops you can then message that subset of your membership with those particular services or you can work in collaboration with other partners as has been the case with uh, one of our projects in Zimbabwe where Econet um, is, is working with us uh, working with the Zimbabwe Farmers Union um, Econet being the telecoms provider uh, and then they're able to provide insurance services in conjunction with the farmers uh, union um, but the association also has a benefit of course the fundamental is it enables far easier membership management and um, it also allows that uh, to ensure that you're far more representing your members because you can improve the communication with the members and seek their views uh, obviously through uh, having the phone numbers the contact points even if you're not linking directly with every farmer you can assign obviously um, points that receive the information in detail by SMS and then confer with the local community but the key thing from the farmers organization is this is a disruptive innovation in terms of it can completely change the business model the farmers organizations are struggling to work on a membership based system by moving into or linking with this uh, a more entrepreneurial uh, level being able to provide services to members maybe in conjunction with other um, startups or uh, mobile app providers um, it does mean they've been able to provide new services and as I said both SACAO the Southern Africa uh, Community of Agriculture Unions and the East African Farmers Federation have moved in this direction. There is a greater power in advocacy um, because obviously the farmers organization can now regularly demonstrate how many members they have and show what kind of uh, crops and uh, yields they're um, overseeing and uh, 
running again, as I say, always remembering from this farmers organization perspective, being able to keep that trust or build that trust with your membership. And in many cases, this simple action of building up this data has improved the trust with the organizations. So where farmers were members and not seeing much activity, the whole, acti the whole idea of having a campaign of data collection has actually brought them back in to link with the organizations. I apologize for the very small t text, but what I really wanted to say here is that there are many um, benefits. Having said the farmers' organizations are representing the farmers, we also have to look at what all this data means for the farmers' organizations' uh, position with the policymakers. So the policymakers, of course, are really interested in all this information in the farmers' profiles. In several countries, they've been doing farmer registration themselves, but many others not. But I think the interesting thing here is you have a situation where the farmers organizations will have data that they can compare and contrast with the National Statistics Office. So if the National Statistical Office is saying there are certain yields, maybe there's a, they, they are concerned about a low yield, but the farmers organization can see in a particular area that this just isn't true, there's a lot of a much a far different role that the farmers organizations can now play in relation to the uh, government uh, statistics, and it gives more of a voice to the farmers' organization. So those key data sets in terms of production, um, in terms of other areas, land usage and some uh, commercial details, it may vary um, from organization to organization as to how uh, that can be shared. But again, the core principle here is do the farm, are the farmers prepared to share this with um, government? How can this data be used? And ordinarily, it would be used at an aggregated uh, level and not be identifiable with individuals. That being a key element all the way along is that the privacy of the in individual farmer is uh, maintained. Um, and uh, depending on the service, if there are exceptions there, they're clearly agreed by the farmer themselves. Um, we're looking at feeding into some of the sustainable development goal discussion because we feel a lot of this data that is being collected by the farmers' organizations, by uh, the mobile application services outside the standard government statistics is a good way of validating progress towards the SDGs and needs to be taken account of. And uh, finally, the, the other element is this idea of the government obviously having some general household data, but again, looking at how this can be aggregated and with the proviso that some of these areas, it must be clear that the data has been provided for this particular use, otherwise uh, it obviously shouldn't be shared. Just to finish on the preliminary findings um, for the profiling work, uh, farmers' awareness sessions, obviously essential before data collection, as I said. The data agreement really contributed to the trust in the association. In um, several of the projects, as I'd said, uh, just having that dialogue and, and showing that the association could map the farmers and have all these other benefits was key. The geolocation information and particularly farm boundaries were essential for calculating inputs to farmers and important in arranging credit. So that geolocation, again, essential. Enumerator training, being aware that there will be difficulties once you get the enumerators into the field. This isn't so straightforward, so you should be aware uh, of having a little bit of flexibility there and being prepared to train more people than you actually keep uh, on that task. And um, always remembering that the tangible printed materials can be really important in decision making and getting management support and finance. So the advantage of a lot of these geo geographical information systems is having that physical map that you can look at. And that in particular aided logistics planning in terms of the location of collection points for one of the partners. And uh, the geolocation and traceability also allowed um, in industries uh, such as coffee, for example, does allow you to say, okay, this coffee is grown above a particular altitude. You can then have a different uh, product for a niche market that's only interested in, in that type of coffee. I'll pass over now to Chipo, 
who will uh, talk a bit about um, the GoDan Action work and how this has also uh, brought a number of uh, lessons which we hope will be of interest to you and I hope this part has been useful. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you very much. I already have a couple of questions for you, but I will leave them at the end of the webinar. Thank you. <laughs> Dipo, uh, you can share your screen now, yeah? Okay, do you see it? Yes. Okay, great. You can also uh, activate your webcam if you like. It's not required. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, so I work with Chris um, uh, in the data for Ag Unit, and one of the projects that we are working on is called Golden Action. Um, Golden is the Global Open Data in Agriculture and Nutrition uh, Initiative. Um, and under the Golden Umbrella, we have a three and a half year project um, that was um, created to allow us to enable uh, a diverse set of users, producers and intermediaries to be able to engage with open data in, in agriculture and nutrition and hopefully bring about solutions to the challenges that um, are faced in the sector. So this project is funded by DFID and in the project we have four focal areas. The first focal area looks at the standards. So this focal area is looking at assessing, mapping what standards exist when it comes to open data in agriculture and nutrition, how open are they, how usable are they, and uh, how, how are they being adopted. And then we have a second focal area which looks at the impact evaluation, so looking at creating uh, tools to assess the impact that open data can make. Um, and then we've got the focal area on capacity development, which is the one that CTA leads. Um, this focal area, we're looking at um, providing the necessary skills to users for them to be able to use data, open data, and create uh, perhaps solutions for, for smallholder farmers, information services, and so forth. And then the last focal area is the research uh, uptake package. So this is looking at taking all the outputs coming out of our three focal areas and uh, promoting uh, adoption for the research that we are undertaking. So what is open data? So basically when we say open data what we mean it's data really that can be that can be accessed that can be used and but can be shared by anyone. Um, when we say it can be accessed, we're talking about it is in a format that's machine readable. Okay, so it's in a format that can it can be linked to other data, it can be accessed from um, other databases, it can be used interoperably with other data sets. And then availability looks at that you know it's available online, so it's not uh, in in a format where you know it's uh, in, a, in a on your desk or offline. And then open data for it to be open, it requires a license. So we're looking at data that has explicitly been licensed for anyone to access, use and share. So it has explicit permissions applied to it. So this is the sort of data that we are looking at and we believe that, you know, with all, um, with um, when we're looking at farmers access to data, open data also has a role to play in providing data-driven services, data-driven businesses. Um, so it's, it's important for us to explore this area and see how we can integrate it with all the other types of data coming from the farm um, as well as outside the farm. So within the project, we have three thematic areas um, that we've been working in, um, weather data, land data, and nutrition data. Um, we started last year with weather data, and as part of our activities uh, for capacity building, we really wanted to get a, a sense of what the landscape is when it comes to weather data, open data, closed data. And so as part of um, our activities, we had last year, a lot, during that same week that you had the workshop in, um, in, in South Africa, 
uh, during date, what we were calling data for Ag Week, we had a workshop where we really looked at how can we create impact for smallholders using weather data. And we brought together various uh, stakeholders, actors along the data value chain. So from providers, your med agencies, together with uh, intermediaries, people like um, Echo Pharma that Chris mentioned, who, who are providing uh, services like in, uh, index-based insurance, as well as um, uh, we looked at what would be the perspective of the users who receive um, these types of services. How can we create more impact for them? So, um, you know, we identified various ways during the workshop that uh, where the data can play a role in within agriculture, from forecasting services to index-based insurance, um, early warning systems, uh, as well as uh, other alerting, alerting and um, SMS delivery systems that are being implemented. So one of our, uh, uh, of the people who, or the organizations that were represented at the workshop, of whom we managed to get a good uh, use case, uh, is CALRO, which is the Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization of Kenya. And they, they shared their case where they are making use of open weather data um, together with data that comes from the Kenya Meteorological Department and have created an agro weather tool that they are providing to uh, several counties within uh, within Kenya. So the way their system works is that they do farmer profiling through on, on, on ground agents who collect personal data from the farmers and then the system itself uh, will geolocate the farm um, and um, the system links that farm to uh, the Ilri soil data database so as to allocate, to, to assign rather a soil pH for that farm. And using this information as well as weather that they are getting from openweathermap.org, which provides uh, a free package of weather data, gives you five-day forecasts, um, together with data from Kenya Meteorological Department, which gives them uh, seasonal forecasts, um, they are able to, to, to provide agronomic um, advice to their farmers. So for example, first of all, they recommend how best these farmers could be using the land uh, by suggesting crop types that they could be using. They could be uh, uh, growing on their farm, um, and then they do they 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 provide a crop calendar for the specific farmers and their farms, um, advising them on which stage at which stage to to carry out the different um, agricultural activities. Um, so so some of the. Uh, advice that they are providing using this type of uh, data, you know, they provide advice on land preparation, crop sowing dates based on rain, rainfall, for example, onset date. They provide crop types and crop varieties that should be planted. Um, they provide uh, advice on fertilizer application based on uh, the five-day uh, rainfall forecasts. Uh, they provide uh, even pest and disease advice um, based on a relative forecasts. So they have seen from their tool so far that it's really provided quite a lot, uh, an increase in productivity for this, um, for these counties from which they are providing the advice. And it's, um, it has not been without its challenges. Um, they are one of the challenges, firstly, is the farmer registration process, which is quite time intensive and, and, and costly. Um, then also the issue of illiteracy, illiteracy rates amongst the smallholder farmers is, has been a challenge. So they have seen that they uh, have required translation services for, uh, for local languages. But the biggest challenge for them has actually been the cost of of uh, sending information of sending this information to the farmers. They have uh, been attempting various models for the pricing. Um, they were currently well. They 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 are pro actually in the process of trying the value based pricing. This is where farmers pay based on how they perceive 
the service to be. Um, so they have incurred some losses um, in terms of infrastructure setup costs and the marketing, but really it's a case of exploring how much, which other business models could be used, could be effective for this type of um, service. Um, and some of the business models which, you know, they are considering, for example, are um, using advertisements um, as well as looking for impact inv investors. So it's an ongoing process with Caro and, you know, they have now received uh, funding uh, from, from, is it USAID, where they are going to build their own servers now and um, they are looking forward to, to actually expanding the tool to other areas. So from our work, um, you know, assessing the situation with weather data, working with different types of stakeholders uh, who, are, who are making use of data, who are creating services, you know, we've seen that definitely uh, there are three factors that we see that are important for there to be better use of open data. So first of all, it's the capacity. So the capacity to use it effectively. Um, it, it, it's, it's okay to talk about opening up data, but if the people don't have the skills to be able to make the, make use of the data and provide actionable information for smallholders, then it's um, it, it, it's a bit pointless. So as part of our project, we've been doing work to assess what are the training needs when it comes to weather data. What is it? What gaps are there? What capacities do people actually need to be able to work with weather data and and create services for farmers? Um, and this has involved various activities. We've developed a, a capacity development working plan from the needs assessment. We've been working um, to to develop working groups within the the wider Golden Partner Network who are bringing their own expertise and their own experience to us and, and, and this is what we are taking to, to build our own training program. So we've managed so far to develop a curriculum uh, that looks at uh, addressing capacity gaps in open data um, and then we have created a set of training materials that we are looking to share openly. Um, a lot of them are already available and what we would like to see is to encourage, you know, as many users as possible who are interested in building capacity also to take these materials and make them their own and have their own events. So to date, we, 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 we through face-to-face e-learning webinars, we can say we've reached over a thousand uh, people now um, within the project and we're looking to, to continue um, along the nutrition theme and the land theme as well this year. And the other factor for improved use is the issue of standards. So uh, standards will provide a good foundation for the integration of weather data and other types of data sets. Um, we see that a lot of the f uh, uh, f uh, data that farmers require, it's, it's, it's from all types, from financial to markets to to all of that. So if we're going to create systems that can work together, that can use all these data sets, there, are need for, there is a need for standards. And so part of our work, we've um, created a, a, a map of uh, the available agriculture, open agriculture data standards. Um, and you can find that uh, on vest.agrisemantics.org. And in addition to that, we've done an, an assessment of the current existing weather data standards and we've assessed their usability, we've assessed how open they are, uh, we've assessed what the adoption is of the weather uh, data standards that are available. Um, and just, uh, you know, briefly, some of the big issues that we see are the issue of um, data availability, its discoverability, its quality and coverage is a big issue. And then the issue that these standards are really not well documented and the differences between the existing uh, uh, standards themselves, because there are so many of them, but then the differences of the overlapping standards really has not been clarified. So that is, those are some of the issues that we see when it comes to the standards. And then the third part really for, for, for us to have more effective use of, of this open data and particularly where the data, there's a need for us to develop the tools to, me to measure the, the, the impact that they are making. If we're going to have more data-driven businesses, uh, investors need evidence. They need to see what sort of impact that we're, 
the open data is making. So really working to assess, to, to create these tools that can measure the assessment is a big part of the project. And we think that this will lead to greater uh, data-based, uh, data-driven business investment, yes. Um, so yes, so this is where we look, we see it from the open data perspective, from the golden action perspective, and we are really interested in uh, working with partners who are on the ground, who uh, would like to share their experience with capacity development, or who are generally just interested in learning more and get, becoming trained in capacity development. We actually have an online course that's starting next week on Monday, and hopefully some of you here, because I think uh, you are in the, our same networks, have probably already seen the advert. Um, so, yeah, that's it from, from, from me. Thank you, Chipo. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, maybe you can put the link to the announcement about the training so that people can uh, go sure. there uh, in the chat window in case they don't know. Okay, we, I think we can start with the questions that people are already asking here in the um, in the chat window. And I, I, the first questions are all about um, early warning for fishermen. And Chris, you already answered here in the chat window, but since we are recording this webinar and people will not see the chat, maybe you want to say something about that? You want to answer? Yes. Um, whilst we didn't cover it in this presentation because we're not currently working in that area, um, we have done some work in the past with the mobile applications um, available to fisher folk, particularly uh, an application called M Fisheries. Um, I was also looking for the other application, um, which I'll, I'll try and put in the chat room, uh, which I think is Ab Abloni, which is in, um, I know was in Southern Africa. And I think we are supporting the use of that in the Seychelles. Um, but I can, I can send more information to the group. But to answer the specific question about um, kind of early warning, um, the, the mobile application, um, in this case, has a number of data elements, one of which is the geolocation. So this is a, using the GPS, which still works with kind of coastal fisheries, um, and can then signal to individual f fishermen who are in an area that's going to be hit by a storm or local conditions. Um, but in addition, because that Fishman has explained what they're able to catch on their fish, what they're particularly going after. They can get data on the market price of those particular fish. Um, and uh, then I guess as a final point, it also helps them with access to credit from the bank because they can use the application to log um, the fishing that they're doing. Now, the link I put in was a final dimension to the use of data in terms of being able to um, represent the fisher folk and question some of the scientific findings fundamentally about fish stocks. So the article I linked to is from the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism, um, where they're apps actually able now, uh, if the US has introduced certain quotas um, for the Caribbean uh, in terms of imports, um, they can question that kind of information because they have potentially their own access to data. And that's a project, as I say, we haven't worked with them for a couple of years now, but I think it's something that was then followed up with FAO. So I would recommend if you're interested um, to have a look at that article on ICT update, but also have a search around for CRFM. Uh, they're a very uh, interesting organization, as I say, representing the fisher folk of the Caribbean. Thanks, Chris. I hope that's useful. Yeah. I, th I think that was uh, exactly what they were expecting from their questions. Uh, there is a comment from Sushit, which is not really a question, but I, I think I can transform this, this into a question because Sushit is just commenting on the example on GI tools and the use of tools like QGIS. Uh, can I ask one of you to, to say something about what, what is uh, so specific about, special about to GIS compared to other GIS tools? Yeah, I think 
I can say a little bit on that. Um, we had a meeting uh, in um, uh, February um, in Uganda uh, to run an experience capitalization workshop to find out, out from the various participants in the projects we've been running in Uganda, uh, how the project had gone, what had been the success factors and others. And, and what was clear there was this was a tool that was much more accessible to the farmer-led business, the farmer-led organization. So it was uh, not so much, it wasn't the same degree of training or the same degree of technology required as some of the more sophisticated GIS systems have been in the past. And the other thing is affordability, that this was something that was more affordable. Um, the other thing that is really good is, in think in the past, a lot of these uh, lower cost tools um, would have had limitations on the output. But QGIS is producing extremely good uh, quality maps. And what the Farmers Association found was it was well worth investing in getting color, good color printouts uh, at a large size in order to convince the management and also the banks uh, to, to really give an idea of the membership and where they were, what they were doing. So just to say that I think Sachith could probably add more um, if, if he wants to in the chat. And uh, I, again, I recommend looking on, on Google to look into the background there. Um, but uh, perhaps it's something that can be in the GoDen Capacity Group uh, to explain some of the benefits of QGIS, because it's clearly one of those things that's kind of revolutionized how it works. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have two questions from Chris Baker. I, I will ask them separately because I think each of the questions uh, will will require uh, quite a long answer. The first one is open data. Regarding open data, what range of data formats are commonly found in open data? Uh, is it mostly spreadsheets? Is asking, but I guess Chris, you're, you're, you mean in open data of a specific type, like coming from the farm? Because otherwise, formats commonly found in open data is everything. But uh, I don't know if you want to specify, or uh, or if Chipo um, or Chris can answer what what are, what are the most common formats used. Okay, so <clears throat> for for open data, there are many formats um, that open data comes in. The common oh, so ones. Chris, Chris specified in agriculture. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah yes. So. I would say you have CSV files being very common. Um, then you have, for example, for, I'll just talk about like, for example, with weather data, a lot of it you have access to it through uh, APIs. Uh, um, um, and then you have also formats like uh, JSON, uh, which is a, a, a simple file format for easy pro programming. So like the tool that um, that I showed, uh, that's the sort of file format that they are using. Um, Chris, I don't know, yeah. what other common ones are there? Yeah, I think what might be quite useful is to see an example. Um, I'm putting up here, um, except I've misspelled it so the link won't work, just one moment. The food security portal from IFPRI, and that gives you an idea. So as Chipo said, I mean, the most accessible for people actually to make use of ends up being the CSV file because then it's easy to manipulate. Um, of course, in terms of true openness, people are still trying to say, well, we don't want to put it in as an Excel file as such. We do want to make sure it's uh, open and not proprietary. But the food security portal gives you an idea of all of those things that Chipo's mentioned with the addition of the whole idea of being able to get open data by running a program. So that would be through uh, an API. Uh, an ap application profile interface so that you can actually interrogate the database with another piece of software. So this is how things like the um, weather forecast app on your phone works. It will interrogate some of the data. And in the case of, um, as uh, Chiba was saying, the open weather data platform, you're actually able to do that for free up to a certain level of use. So this means you can write your own mobile app that reads the weather for your local location from the open weather map. 
But the Food Security Board gives you an idea of the various ways that the open data in the agriculture sector is presented. They've brought together a lot of the World Bank and other uh, services. Yeah, I, I think this is also the conclusion that we drew from the project, from the Golden Action Project, in terms Share of screen. most used formats. Who is sharing the screen? <laughs> Okay, if if uh, if it is not Chris or Chip or sharing the screen, could you could you not share the screen? Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, Chris, I was saying. I think also the conclusions from the Golden Action Project and the, the the work package on standards in the end were the same. That the most used formats are in the end CSV, uh, JSON when you have an API, especially for weather data. That was yeah what we found. And there is another question from Chris. Uh, how do you integrate different types of data for use in services and ensure interoperability for real-time access to data sets online? This is difficult. Who wants to answer? I don't mind making a start. Um, <laughs> the, the thing is to really be clear on uh, <coughs> which services need that full updated dynamic access. Um, the advantage of the owner system that I'd said is you have just that because it's online, it's shareable, um, you can interact with it in different ways to interrogate the database. Um, and the whole point, of course, is how you build your app as to how you integrate these different services as well. So the farmers organization can have a core data collection, but then there may be other profiles drawn from other data sets. So the way people tend to talk about it now is about having a data cube, which might mean it's kind of made up of a lot of different data sources, but those can be drawn on to give the particular answer for a service. So I'm realizing I'm probably not being too clear, but if we looked at the idea of combining services, um, the key thing is to look at how those can be made available in the cloud. Now, a lot of this depends on location and connectivity. Uh, and so what tends to happen, as we found in a project in Samoa, for example, um, the data will be updated when there is connectivity. So it's collected in the field. It may even be a week before that data is fully validated and uploaded, but it goes into one database in the cloud that can then be interrogated for the different services, be it certification, be it uh, training, the number of people trained, um, be it selecting focal points, it's all accessed uh, online. But it doesn't physically have to be in the same database. It can be in assortment of different file formats. And that's how many of the, the new um, software applications will now work. They won't just draw on one central database. Yeah, I agree with that. And we have a question from, I don't know, Chipo, did you want to add something on this? Um, well, yes, well, I was just going to say uh, how important it is to ensure um, that you are making use of commonly used standards, um, perhaps uh, ensuring that, to ensure that the data is discoverable and will work with other data sets, we need to ensure that um, we're making use of existing standards, not duplicating or creating new standards, uh, perhaps building on existing standards. Um, and making use of uh, other frameworks, such as perhaps the FAIR principles, um, when we're looking at uh, data interoperability. I, I couldn't agree more, obviously. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, there is a question from uh, David. Uh, David is asking, what were the most common drivers for small older farmers signing up and paying for a service? Mm. You, you were answering, Chris. We cannot We've been working with the Pan-African Farmers Organization, but also with the World Farmers Organization, and they've spent a lot of time in this area. One of the key things that farmers, rural farmers have been interested in is insurance, and that is um, uh, effectively 
looking not at insurance against crop loss, but if you like a type of life insurance that the main uh, farmer, um, if, if they pass away, how is the family supported? And bundling that life insurance with things like climate insurance uh, to support drought, that is something that people will pay with. So you have to understand the key concerns at the rural level to understand what would be um, effective as a service. Now, the other complication is who pays. So what is happening in a lot of countries is they're providing vouchers for things like extension services. So the World Bank has, I think, active projects in three African countries now, I think one of which would be um, Uganda, where as a result of the farmers' organizations or others collecting information with the profiles for the farmers, they can now address those farmers and offer them e-vouchers which they can spend on services. So we're no longer necessarily talking about the money coming directly from the farmer, but we're talking about the farmer having a choice as to what they're paying for. Now, obviously, we've focused on the agricultural services. So this idea of the funeral insurance um, for the farmer uh, is bundled with the Climate Smart, and that's why we've gone into it. So I see others mentioning health insurance. I think there are a whole range of other services um, which obviously are of interest. But I think this voucher system where government starts to take responsibility because they see they can improve yield. And we obviously saw this in Nigeria where the subsidies for fertilizers have been provided through e-wallets. Uh, as a result of doing the farmer registration at government level, that there are opportunities here. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, uh, it was so long. <laughs> no, I think this is what we're, people were expecting. There are a couple of other questions. One is from Oscar, and he says, perhaps I missed this part of the presentation, but what measures have you guys employed to involve rural farmers to help collect accurate data? in agriculture. So in the, perhaps I start with the data for ag um, project, Chipo, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, we focused on this data collection at a certain level, and so we've gone through this training of enumerators. So we're actually saying these enumerators may be from the rural farmer group. Now, in the case of the associations we've worked with, it's been a mixture. In, in some cases, it's even been factory workers with, say, the tea, who, because it's not at the time of maximum processing, uh, they were available to train as enumerators. But in order to keep the quality of the data and the accuracy of the data, it does mean those enumerators need to go through certain training. And, and there are some very basic things. Um, in most cases, you do need to know the age of the farmer, but there's no point in trying to get an exact date or a month. You, you, you know, you will get the year. Um, so being clear on how you have that conversation to establish age and uh, making sure that, the, you know, the farmer understands it's, it's for a particular reason. You, you have to kind of have some training to avoid getting the farmer just to say what they think you want to hear. Um, and by explaining how the data is going to be used, it, it, it can, of course, be a bit tricky. But uh, because the associations have some experience in knowing what the general set of farmers are doing in that area, they, they can have an idea of what's going to be a realistic uh, yield projection, for example. So to answer your question, it's not just rural farmers we're working with, but it is this key aspect of the enumeration training, which is uh, very important. Thanks. I have another, other, another two questions. One is from Boniface. Um, okay, one is just an observation. He says, yes, data integration can be undertaken from several perspectives. For example, the different data sets can be pulled into a single database or the database can read from each other. So it could be, okay, centralized or distributed. But the, then uh, Boniface is saying farmers need to see impact from the data services or products they are availed, that are availed to them. For example, proactive advisories, crop insurance. Uh, yeah, I, I, I assume you agree, Chris uh, and Chipo, this is an observation rather than a question. 
do, do you want to elaborate on that? Is I guess it's um, we we all agree on that. Yeah, we agree on that. And like I said, it's a big part of the project on actually assessing uh, in terms this is in terms of open data existing projects that are on the ground that are working with open data to see how farmers are actually benefiting at the end of the day from this um, because this will have you know implications for any future investments in, in data driven businesses. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. And then we have a question from Oludare. He's asking, uh, are we also, oh, this is interesting, are we also looking at farmers indigenous ways of storing information as part of the process? Yeah, th this is really interesting to me because we're just um, planning a project in Burkina right now, um, where they're trying, to, they're also trying to incorporate I exactly some of that uh, um, that linkage. Now, there's sort of two sides to this, obviously, um, understanding how the information is stored uh, at a local level um, by the farmer, so linking be it uh, logs or be it uh, local uh, advisory um, and on paper, but we're also uh, looking at how some of that indigenous knowledge can be collected digitally. Now, the only thing with this project is we're extremely focused on the data element. So that isn't part of our remit directly, but the partners we're working with are specifically looking at that uh, in terms of interest and uh, I can try and uh, sort out a reference for you because I agree Valeria I think this is an interesting uh, dimension. Yeah this is something that also we at GIFR it's a type of question that we encounter a lot when we talk about data and then they ask us okay it's just data or is it uh, indigenous knowledge are there different ways of storing this uh, especially when it comes to indigenous knowledge I agree it's a very interesting area. We have another question. Do you still have time, Chris and Chipo, for another question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a question, another question from David. Uh, he's asking, do you think it's viable to try to digitize any historical information, like production, da production data held on paper at a local level? Yeah, I mean, I think we'd say that was our experience with the higher value crops. So where you had something like tea, I think they've been looking quite seriously at digitizing previous records so that they can look at trends. Um, in in terms of uh, our work with SACAO, they also did specifically this transfer of paper records to do their profiling. Um, the problem is, how far you're going back and how relevant that information is. So it's the normal balance of, you know, what what is the benefit of the investment in transforming the data. What we found with membership data, for example, was that um, this was really very difficult. It wasn't worth transferring all the information, but the information that would allow you to contact the member to check the information, that was worth uh, taking up. But um, it, it obviously depends on how those paper records were also collected in the first place. Chipa, is there anything? Can I, can I go for one last question? Yeah, yeah. I have, I have another question from Oscar. He says, you talked uh, of trained enumerators. Are they from any associ association like farmers organization, organization or a member of the community? I, I think I did touch on this. They are a mixture. So it's been depending on the project as to how the organization set up. Um, so as I was saying, the association uh, members uh, had been used as enumerators together with members of the community as well. And uh, it would depend on the commodity, the size of the association. Um, but ideally, of course, to get that acceptance and trust, it's really important to use a member of the community if possible. Um, but logistics comes in very soon. Organizing the training courses and the rest means that you have to work in a real world. So, you know, I think uh, there are trade-offs there and we have changed to adjust to that. Thanks. And I, I think we can conclude on an observation that uh, I have here in the chat. Uh, Oludare is, uh, this is just an observation, but it's a nice conclusion, although very ambitious, is saying as a way forward, 
we need to have a common platform where all stakeholders will be engaged and trained in data collection, processing, analysis and dissemination. But maybe this could be a nice introduction to uh, perhaps saying something about the paper that we are writing together, Chris, uh, GFAR, CTA and Godan. Uh, which is on harnessing the benefits of data uh, for um, smallholder farmers. And the final part of the paper uh, is actually uh, trying to answer the question of who is going to provide platforms for exactly for harnessing the benefit of data for farmers. And we say something in the paper about the role of farmers' organizations. So it is uh, something that's really related to this webinar. I don't know, Chris, if you want to say something else about this paper. Well, I, I think it's it's really interesting um, to try and make sense of this whole area. And uh, I think the white papers are a really nice um, summary of the various aspects. And, and in particular, looking at some of the considerations you have to make moving into this area into how it actually operates. So I, I really congratulate the GFAR team and the team that was involved in the training in, in putting a lot of that together. Um, I think what would also be interesting is to take this forward and uh, whilst it may be very ambitious to have a, a complete training platform, I, I think we could still be moving in that direction and at the minimum to build up a kind of reference library. Um, and I, I think we're interested in contributing to that. I, I mentioned a number of, um, the, the presentation draws on a number of reports and papers we've produced. Um, we can kind of uh, provide more of a, uh, the bibliography in fact I think is in the white paper really of most of the things that would cover the areas I've been talking about in more detail. Yes. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah. I was just saying that we will send the link to the to this white paper to all the participants once it's published. It should be published in the next week or ten days, so we will send the link to everybody. And CTA is one of the publishers, and uh, Chris and uh, Peter Ballantyne from CTA co contributed a lot. We are very proud of the results. So I guess we we can close the webinar. People have asked all their questions. Thanks everybody for joining us. And in particular, thanks to Chipo and to Chris for your presentations and your answers to the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Valeria. Bye. Goodbye.